Okay, this is a winter ready, um, being brilliant to basics, calf rearing um, reminder webinar, I suppose, or um, presentation um, brought to you uh, by Precision Microbes. So I'm going to talk about practical applications of Precision Microbes. I'm also going to talk a little bit about good calf rearing, um, psychology and behavior, habits around calf rearing. And I, I heard this quote recently, the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining so uh, ahead of calf calving season just look at some top tips around calf health um, my name is Tommy Heffernan I'm a veterinary consultant look vast experience and I think calf health is one area that I've uh, a bit of expertise in because I've worked so long and I've read so much about it in practical application in that area as well um, I've worked with Precision Microbes for the last two years. We're very much focused in the calf health space with our unique liquid pro and postbiotics. And I have to say the most exciting products and project I've got to work in in my 21 year nearly career now. So what I'm going to cover, I'm going to look at uh, Precision Microbes, a quick reminder on sort of applications. I'm going to talk about as well a bit about calf health, the calf rearing, the system, looking at the systematic approach. Small bit on psychology and behavior around calf rearing. Um, because people are the biggest driver for calf health um, and about doing the simple things well. What are those simple things? And attention to detail and consistency. So if you look at my concept of being brilliant at the basics, it is around this attention to detail and consistency, which if you apply those rules, not just to calf rearing, but other things, you'll deliver results. But that's a, that's a, a different story. Um, when we look at the calf and, and gut health, and we think about the gut microbiome, just a quick explainer about that. So um, the gut microbiome is these trillions of microbes inside in the digestive system working collectively like an organ. Um, and it's the same in calves or cells or other animal species. And there's three core functions that these beneficial uh, microbes have in the digestive tract. They're key to digestive health for the production of dis different enzymes and breakdown of metabolite, uh, production of metabolites. They're involved in immune function. So 70% of the immune function of our calves are in the gut. This is a gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And the reason we have so many white blood cells and immunity in the gut is, well, if we think about the surface area of the gut, um, it's absolutely huge. So they provide protection in that area um, and all, they interact with the white blood cells in the gut. So if we have disruption into the gut, well, then we're going to have an impact on immunity. Um, these beneficial microbes also compete with harmful pathogens. Uh, none of us would be here without those innate defenses. So in simple terms, the good versus bad bacteria. So a healthy gut microbiome really sets up um, for a healthy calf. And that's what Precision Microbes is aimed at doing and supporting, is supporting a healthy digestive tract and gut health in calves. So when we look at the use of probiotics, we, we're trying to mimic, okay, these are my animations for probiotics. We're trying to mimic what beneficial bacteria are doing in there. And that's improve digestive function, uh, regulate immunity, and compete with harmful pathogens. Now, when you look at all the, the consumer feedback on probiotics, inconsistent results on feed additives comes up, and that would have been something I would have seen prior to maybe been two years ago been involved with precision microbes. But my mind has been completely blown uh, what I've learned and seen uh, with the nature of what we're doing uh, and the differences uh, and the approaches we're using and the results we're delivering on farm. So why is precision microbes different? Well, we have to understand some definitions. So when we think about uh, direct fed microbials, we think about prebiotics, which are essentially the feed for good bacteria. Fiber is a good example of that. We actually have prebiotics in colostrum, mosses and fossas, oligosaccharides, and they're feed to drive on uh, and help um, the, the good bacteria in the gut. You can use prebiotics. Probiotics then are the beneficial bacteria we use um, to mimic what the beneficial bacteria would be doing in the gut, but they're very much like factories. So it's actually what they produce the postbiotic metabolites, which are really important, this is what acts at cell level. So precision microbes is very unique in that it's a liquid and it's a pro and postbiotic liquid. So we culture these live bacteria into their log phase where they're producing all these important metabolites or postbiotics, and then we shut down the pH. So it's a very, very unique um, blend uh, targeted at calf health. So just by way of def or just to explain to people about why it's different, so prebiotics are the feed for good bacteria, probiotics are the good bacteria themselves, and postbiotics then are the metabolites they produce. And why that's important is when we look in at a cross section of the digestive tract and we look at um, dysbiosis or damaged digestive tract, or we look at a eubiosis, so a healthy digestive tract with cells, nice cell integrity, nice mucus production, protecting it, a nice immune regulation here. Um, whether we're maintaining eubiosis 
or when we're trying to stabilize the gut and return normal function, it is the postbiotic metabolites that play a key role. So um, that's why we actually have two applications for precision microbes. It can be used at higher dose levels, and that's where a lot of people would have come across it first for calves recovering from diarrhea or disruption. Actually, Enterococcus visium, NCIMB 10415 is licensed for that role in stabilization. But also, when we look at lower doses, we can actually, and that's the proper application I'll speak about, can help maintain good digestive health and function. And I really simplify this down to if we think about the gut like a sponge, we want that healthy sponge absorbing all the nutrients. So when I was doing the trial work or many farmers who've seen precision microbes working will actually see a difference in the calves. And that's simply because the calves with a healthy digestive tract are actually digesting all their nutrients um, and calf tribe and performance improves. Where we have a damaged digestive tract, well, that's going to be impaired. So again, very unique. If we think about having all these postbiotics, it's a prone postbiotic liquid in the, in the actual uh, liquid. Well, then we think of administration, we're going to see that speed of action, particularly with these postbiotics being key to stabilizing the gut versus maybe having what a lot of people do is they take the bacteria and they freeze dry them, which is commercially easier to do. But the challenge around freeze dried bacteria is they have to rehydrate to go through their lag and log phase, then produce their metabolites. If we've got a diarrhea in a calf, we've got increased gut transit time, they've got to get past stomach acid. So it's very, very unique formulation um, in, in relation to what we're doing at Precision Microbes. Again, they're, they're, they're cultured using very unique herbs. Now, metabolomics has allowed us to understand what, what we're actually, you know, why we're putting in these things to culture these bacteria and the role that they actually, those herbs themselves, have to play in gut health. And that's why we're seeing the results that we're seeing. Very unique formulation. Okay, um, it's the only pro and postbiotic liquid in the market. I was involved with the trial work, um, control treatment groups. You know, we saw improved average daily gain between treated calves and controlled calves. That depended farm to farm on a lot of things, level of milk feeding, level of pressure, and some of the other challenges. But all across the trials I did, we saw reduction of scours, big reduction in interventions of sick calves, and antibiotics. So uh, the products are available through vets here in Ireland, and you know, really. Uh, it's exciting to see the reduction of antibiotics just by the use of precision microbes. So the product's available in one litre, this is often where people get introduced to the product, and then a 10 litre for larger use. Now we're bringing our bag and box to the market this year, so we're reducing plastic by 90%. Yeah, there's a little tap here you bring out through the box, um, and we're also increasing shelf life to 18 months. So when you open the can, you have two months to use the product, but now because of the integrity of the product within the bag, um, we have an 18-month shelf life. Um, one of the things people have said to me about the cardboard box is it's got, a pla it's got a coating or a veneer on the outside of it, but it is prone to getting wet, so we need to be careful with it. I know plastic cans are more robust, but certainly it's just, look, it's a change in adaption um, from a reduction of plastic and certainly from a quality of the integrity of the product is far superior. So this is going to be the format for the spring in 2023. Um, it can be fed in milk. It's a massive help with calf. Uh, with appetite and calf performance. And where I've seen that is maybe calves recovering from diarrhea, maybe calves transitioning. You can go to our website to hear a lot of the stories, but calves transitioning maybe onto automatic feeders, maybe they've been on whole milk. That transition is much smoother because calves actually really like the taste of the product. And my key message is this is a game changer in gut health and calf health. So from a long-term perspective, what we're looking for is 30 mils from birth uh, daily per calf, uh, or people maybe rip buying in calves, maybe a little bit later in the season for that message, but um, calves, 30 mil arrival right up to weaning, and it can be fed through milk. Uh, like we just to give you a perspective, we launched into mid-February 21, so we got, we've got a season and a half now done in the calf market in Ireland, but we're in seven countries in Europe, and we're actually sending our first product to Down Under. So it's a huge Irish agri success uh, startup, agri success story as well, but you can only achieve that if you're delivering results. Um, and it's really the product itself uh, is, is, is a really visual tool when people start using it in relation to calf health. So we, when we go back to the gut, there's two applications. So a lot of people would have seen, you know, maybe groups of calves that are recovering from scour can be fed in milk at 60 mils daily for five to seven days. And that's where a lot of people, if you've seen it working last spring or the season before on calves, 
Um, well then it's now time to move to the maintenance dose try and get to that lower dose for longer and um, certainly for people who haven't used it yet it's often where people will start they might try a batch of calves I often say to people if you want to see the product working try a batch of calves on it and see can you see a difference um, and that's one thing with precision microbes is the visual difference people will see in animals you know for your more acute cases then it's 60 mils twice a day for three days but generally that's where most people have come across the product will be maybe calves recovering from diarrhea so at different dose rates um, higher applications we can help with recovery or gut stabilization and then at lower doses it's about health and maintenance uh, and calf performance 70 percent of the immunity is based in the gut so we can see why long-term use and um, of precision microbes is going to help with overall calf health as well practically on farm you can go to our website you can read about um, some of the trial work that's been done but i think the best uh, advocates for our product are, are actually farmers and vets are talking about the difference that they're seeing what I saw in the trials initially was when I was looking at calves recovering from diarrhea was the speed of recovery and that's been recognized now I think right across the, the Irish market and other places people see a visual difference because of that rapid speed of recovery with, with particularly with the postbiotics but one of the consistent things I saw in the trials as well was appetite calf thrive and performance reduction in calf diarrhea um, some farms like incredible results with reduction but overall always um, you know lot, particularly in long-term use was the reduction in calf scour and again it's available through vets here in Ireland so it's about a case by case you know if we're a heavy challenge of cryptosporidium and um, you may be using other treatments as well as precision microbes but but um, for me, it's a visual difference we see in calf performance. Um, and you can have all the data on trial work. When you have a product that does that, it's very powerful. So the message long term now, or for long term use now is 30 mils from birth to weaning, or 30 mils from arrival to weaning. Um, that's for long term use, and there's certainly some advocates. Um, but most people, we're trying to get a message that's, I suppose, getting people to see the product working. And what we're doing is a campaign for January, just 30 mils for 30 days. So this is 30 mils per calf. For 30 days um, just to see the benefits for long-term use um, and again we're going to use the people who've actually used the product telling the story because we've got 30 testimonials for the 30 days of January or with people's experience both vets and farmers now during that 30 minutes for 30 days period if you do see calf diarrhea you can top calves up with an extra 30 mils a day for three to four days earlier you get in the probably less you need to give in relation to days so you can do 30 mils for two days um, and what, what I've seen across all the trial work as well and practically now as well on farms is the recovery is much quicker and um, talk to your local vet practice about precision microbes and um, we're doing a social media campaign for the month of January and each day someone can win a pair of precision microbes uh, born to farm um, socks but also there's an overall prize from the team at precision microbes and Intricum Ireland uh, of 30 litres uh, of calf product for the spring so that's our 30 for mills for 30 days 30 for 30 campaign coming to you in january okay so now a little bit on calf rearing tips again the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining so probably a good time to put out this uh, video and this messaging around calf health because you know what can we do thinking about calf health and calf rearing before calves arrive in the springtime that maybe can make a difference to overall performance and outcomes I have the concept of being brilliant at basics and these are my top six areas to focus focus even focus focus on with calf health and they're pretty simple uh, they're colostrum feeding hygiene fresh air or air movements calf comfort and space they are the six things that if we can get these right we'll rear healthier calves so you know I have to say the biggest factor that impacts calf health is people when I started working as a vet first of all you know I was very much focused on disease treatments and then I realized if you want to rear healthy calves I needed to know a bit about feeding because nutrition plays a huge role in health and then I also had to understand a little bit more about the environment that calves are in and the environmental factors that affect calf health so that's kind of they were the start to the bottom and move up to these two and I got pretty good at managing calf health I think the next level up was understanding that people are the biggest driver in calf health. People make the decisions around daily protocols, 
around you know things we do it's our habits that we develop around calf health and um, that really deliver results so that's why i suppose and i'm inherently even though i am a vet uh, you're allowed to be interested in different things even though your your your, your uh, qualification says you have to do this i'm inherently very interested in people and behavior because i think it drives so much of um, the output outcomes on farm is if i un for me understanding behavior a little bit better so when we look at people performance one slide and it was actually this is it was a robert kennedy quote the time to repair not fix the roof uh, repair the roof is when the sun is shining and i heard that recently i think it's so appropriate for maybe the preventative approach so when we look at people performance where we're looking at anything you know some of the simple things you know self-awareness where am i so where are you with calf rearing what you know are you excellent calf rearer are you middling calf rearer as one of the big challenges on farm so you know what's working What's not? What disease issues are we getting year on year? And what do I need to start doing a little bit differently? So when you're listening to the rest of this, is there some things we can do a little bit more on farm to improve uh, overall performance? And, you know, when we're looking at performance as well, we, you know, having goals or outcomes that we'd like to achieve, and that's if whether it's bloody weight loss or business outcomes or uh, personal outcomes, you know, setting some goals or targets is useful. So, what are your goals for calf rearing you know uh, bearing in mind future challenges maybe you know a lot of people will be rearing calves more calves at home if live experts go you know what are the challenges that we are the goals we need to set we want to set you know weaning weights and um, reduction of mortality reduction of maybe morbidity and disease and um, what genetics am i currently using on my cows you know is that the right genetics to make sure of a saleable calf these are all the goals of the farm but what is way more important and then goals is the process and system so uh, you know goals are fine so i want to wean at certain weight i want to reduce mortality whatever i need to do but what are the processes and systems in our calf rearing that we need to get right to help us achieve that and there's a very important rule the one percent rule this idea of progress over perfection um, and that is that you know slow changes over time will deliver results you solve your pneumonia issue this year you might have a calf scar issue the following year there's always challenges coming so we're constantly if we constantly move um, go backwards if we constantly move forward and make progress we're constantly refining our system and make it easier and consistency is absolutely key with calf rearing around feeding bedding and management so then when we look at the process and systems we can look at the kind of habits so this is the same principles i would you know i do a little bit of coaching as well and these are the kind of habits what habits do we need to develop that are really important and say habits is how often do i clean feeding equipment and how easy can i make a habit that habit of cleaning how easy can i make that on farm so i'm going to repeat it more often if something is easier we'll do it more often so that's about the habits so that's a little bit on the performance side now you could talk i could talk for a long time on this but some of the key messages is where are you how can you get better what do we need to start doing what's the objective when it comes to calf rearing are you are you going to be rearing your own calves in two or three years have we the facilities and what systems do we set up to help us achieve that and what are the good habits daily habits that that really help achieve good calf health again <clears throat> records are useful here um, they're important that we have measurements so we can only measure what we manage measuring what matters is another one I like um, but you know what are the key things we need to look at mortality is an obvious one morbidity average daily gain weaning weights and, and general calf health and how can we do this in a backdrop with less labor on farm um, and reduction of antibiotics so lots of challenges out there but what are the targets what's your current performance and where can we make little tweaks um, your medicine records will tell you your mortality figures will, t will tell you you know yourself from last spring where did, where did you fall down in kaffir and where can you make things a little bit better one thing i want to talk about before i get into the calf rearing is this idea about optimizing biology um, and this came from i was looking to do a no field scholarship in 2018 and this was my main real takeaway and now i work across species it's been a very useful template for me to look at and that is you know understanding whatever animal that we're that, we're, that i'm working with it could even go back to humans i mean understanding the calf what are the needs of the calf because if we can understand them we can build better systems around the calf keeping the calf healthier so we look at biological feeding you know calf can drink 10 or 12 liters a day 
drink suckle eight to ten times a day and um, so the more you move away from that biological norm maybe the more challenges that are there you know the temperature of a calf the calf likes the critical temperatures are cr critical the temperature temperature neutral zone or the critical temperature a calf likes i made a mouthful of that is a lot higher than, than a cow or an adult ruminant because that rumen is there generating so much heat um, but a calf's a monogastric like us, they're very prone to the cold so we need to think about a calf completely different to a cow. Um, behaviours of the calf, we are learning more about them as social creatures, they learn from each other, we think about maybe single pens or doubling up calves and just thinking about calves kind of positive, like kind of negative experience, positive experiences. Like even a simple thing like a calf will lie 80 85% of the day. That means that the calf's nose about six inches off the ground for most of the day. Again, we look at natural behaviors of calves in a house. I was on a farm recently that was using precision microbes and the farmer just commented on, on all the positives. But one thing he said, the calves are playing more. Calves are happier. Uh, happy calves are healthy calves. They're thriving and they're growing. So optimizing biology for me is good for the calf. It's more profitable for the farmer. And as we look at calf and calf rearing for the consumer of the future as well, because that's important from our market perspective. Um, and I, you know, there's lots of issues, you know, lots of conversations around uh, cow calf separation. And um, I think in uh, seasonal systems that it's an absolute necessity uh, to rearing healthy calves. And um, it is a slight stressor on the calf, but there's much, much bigger stressors in the calf's journey along the way to weaning, other than that separation piece. But it's still the number one consumer concern globally across all trends. So um, for me, optimizing biology is a good answer uh, and it covers a healthier calf, a more profitable um, farm enterprise and it's the story for the consumer. Uh, so what's good for calf is good for everybody and I use that principle with cows and other species as well. Okay, again, a little bit, I did a bit on this on in my Nuffield, looking at human infants and the cow or the calf. There's certain behaviors that um, will help when it comes to good stockmanship or good calf rearing. I actually probably would make a very bad calf rearer because I'm quite impatient, I move too quickly, um, and patience, quite inconsistency, is kind of a key element to calf rearing. Um, again, I know labor and work, is a, or people is a shortage on farm, so this can be, you know, this might be a little bit aspirational, but if we do look at people, and I've seen this in farms, to bring people maybe that haven't been working on farms before or of different industries that actually really enjoy calf rearing. These are the types of um, things we're looking for with people because calves love consistency. And like one thing I, one thing, one of the things I've learned over the last couple of years is stress has a massive impact on calves. And I'll explain that. And healthy calves will grow and perform. So the more we can be um, a lot of these behaviors around calves, the healthier they'll be. Something a little bit different just to think about. So when we look at any infectious disease, I call this the seesaw principle. So we're trying to drive down infection pressure and we're trying to increase immunity. So infection pressure is the level of bacteria or pathogens animals are exposed to. So if we think about buying in calves and we're buying in calves with snotty noses and dirty bums and scours, they're a source of infection. So we think about infection pressure in housing. We're trying to always reduce that down. Now we know there's infection on farms. That's a normal part of farms. So we need to also look at the immunity piece. What can we do to drive up immunity? Um, colostrum is the obvious one, but there's lots of other things. Obviously precision microbes is in that space of uh, working in good gut health and maintenance of good gut health. And with all that immune system there, it makes sense that we're in the immunity space. space. Actually, if you think about actually the good bacteria and their competitive nature, well, that actually driving down infection pressure as well. So stress has a massive impact on immunity. That's my key message here. So stress has a massive impact on immunity. And if we think about stressors for the calf, they're multifactorial. So poor dry cow management does have an impact on colostrum quality. If we're a suckler or beef farmer and we're going for a bigger calf, a hard calving has an impact. So just to, I suppose by way of an animation, if we think about a healthy immune system it provides protection against pathogens. Um, so anything like, you know, if we look at feeding inconsistencies, um, environment, the weather, changes, disease, you know, if we get scour, we're six times more likely to get calf pneumonia. Bad handling, debudding, dehorning, they all create little chinks in the immunity armor. Um, 
and transport is another massive stress when we look at rearing calves. And what we're essentially looking at there is when we get stress and we get a reduction in immunity, and that's the same as our cells, we get, you know, the pathogens getting, I suppose, their ability to take hold, propagate, and, and cause problems. So if we think about, I suppose, that's what precision microbes is doing in the gut, it's they're supporting the immune system in the gut, particularly the postbiotics. But we must understand all the different stressors in calf health um, that can impact stress. And stress will drive down immunity. And that is a really key message for me. So just before we get into the six areas of calf health, challenges okay there's lots of challenges in dairy uh, dairy farming the calf one is 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 a big one because we have numbers we've a large number of cows calving it's a seasonal nature we're getting more compact calving most of our calves are arriving february march and april you know we look at ex live exports been challenged we look at maybe um the numbers of people around and available to rear calves these are all challenges we need to look at in dairy farms uh, and we need to look adapt to our mindset and understand that these are challenges these are going to be for the next decade so we're going to have to look at good calf rearing as a high priority um on farm and um, look, even looking at you know having saleable marketable calves you know the genetics we're choosing and um, certainly genetics is important I, heard, I was listening to another webinar this morning they were talking about genetics loads the gun and um, but management pulls the trigger so again looking at uh, the challenges we need to to, to to think about with calves and there's loads of opportunities as well we're, we're, we're seeing um all this information around calf rearing we're looking at automatic feeding uh, stations and how they're making life a little bit easier once they're used correctly so there's lots of opportunities to improve calf health um, new vaccines very very unique pro and postbiotic liquids to help farmers um, might be biased there but you know there's lots of opportunities we need to be aware of but so there's a certain amount of challenges but again the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining so let's think about calf health proactively let's think about calf rearing for the next decade on our farms now back into actually calf rearing it's a system so it's a really systematic uh, process from uh, the dry cow right up to weaning we'll say and what i'm always looking for in farms be it mastitis calf rearing calf pneumonia lameness i'm looking for the bottlenecks i'm looking for the restrictions in that system that are causing challenges and i'm always trying to focus more and more on attention to detail and provide consistency for the calf and their environment and feeding so when we look at that then in a the system what are the daily habits for successful calf rearing Okay. Think about the habits we have. Think about what we're needed to be good for good calf rearing. And what are the habits for successful calf rearing? Again, if we look at dry cow nutrition, calving time, feeding, stocking densities, every farm will have bottlenecks. So if we look at uh, the ideal perfection, you know, the calf is born and reared up to weaning and there's no weak links in the chain. But every farm has weak, link, weak links. So it's about identifying these bottlenecks and removing one of these, strengthening this chain to help with overall calf rearing. For a lot of farms, one of the big ones has been post quota is we've increased numbers on calf sheds. Now we're, we're catching up on that space for calves uh, on farm. Big bottleneck was the environment. So more and more farms now are looking at that and looking at rearing calves and Produce, uh, building su suitable facilities remembering a calf is very much not like a cow and that's the one percent rule you know slowly progress over perfection perfection will never be attained in anything and certainly not in farming because there'll be a there'll be a cold winter or a wet winter or some other challenge that will come along that will will upset the apple cart but it is about knowing that it's a system eliminating as many bottlenecks as we can and responding quickly to bottlenecks when they do arrive so, you know, just examples of bottlenecks, feeding the cow, you know, particularly if we look at heifers, even pre-calving, you know, having in inadequate facilities for heifers puts a lot of stress in them, can affect colostrum quality. Hygiene and calving pens, you know, if that's very poor and we're doing colostrum and everything else right, that's something we work on. Space per cow, how clean are the others? Colostrum is the big bottleneck on most farms. Um, air movement, space per calf, calf accommodation. So again, look, looking at you know just colostrum hygiene and milk hygiene. Here are some plates I have tested, um, done some swabs and looked at the, the bacteria that are milking colostrum. So hygiene is a bottleneck as well. So bottlenecks are weak links in our calf rearing system. So if we think about this system, how do we identify bottlenecks? This is my calf health checklist that I use, and it's a very systematic approach. 
to a system based uh, calf, calf helping, calf rearing being very systematic, I look at it in a systematic way, trying to identify the weak links. I think with the calf health checklist, it's very important that it's multifactorial. There's lots of things we can look at and small changes over time. You know, two changes this year, two changes the following year. And, you know, these really accumulate. Um, so that's the calf health checklist. The greens are really important as well. So recognize what you're doing well. So again, when we think about infectious disease in particular, we're trying to reduce infection pressure and we're trying to improve immunity. The seesaw principle, as I call it, anytime I see disease on farm, infectious disease, these are the first things I think about. Right, where's all the source of this infection and is there something happening with immunity? Is there some, these are the basic principles I go back to and have stood the test of time with me from a practical setting. So immunity is really key as well. And there's lots of things that affect immunity. We've got really good at hammering the colostrum story around immunity, and we still, that's a really important message, obviously. But there's other things that can affect immunity as well. So if we look at before the calf arrives, again, on the immunity piece, for the cow, it's like pre-season training, but that has a role to play in calf health. We know, you know, infectious diseases in utero, but if we think about just purely colostrum quality, and that impact on calf health. If we look, look at the cow, when does she actually start producing colostrum in the other, probably 14 to seven days before calving. We know that that's a totally different um, substance or liquid to milk and there's, you know, requires energy and protein to produce it. The cow will genetically produce best quality at, at times. So what can we do diet wise to support the cow? Again, if we've got very poor quality silage, is that going to have an impact on colostrum quality? Uh, again, underestimated but stress on heifers and even cows pre-calving can impact colostrum quality but i think particularly with heifers they're very prone to stress around their you know their timing of their introduction on the farm they have to get used to being milked and all these processes that can have an impact on heifers and their immune system but also can impact colostrum quality so we're trying to think about the things that affect immunity from a colostrum perspective pre-calving if we're thinking about calf health and then we're thinking about infection pressure. We think about calving pens, we think about feeding equipment, we think about space. Like, so the level of infection, um, how can we drive that down? With disinfection between seasons, making, you know, using appropriate disinfectants, infect, disinfectants, if it's crypto or coccidiosis we're dealing with. Um, again, can we have an all in, all out system? Can we clean between seasons as well? But pre-calving preparation is just, okay, how do I set up the season my for the calving time that pens are clean? Um, and I think that's a really important, you know, preparation phase as well. So just go to calf diarrhea. So if we think about, let's pick rotavirus, and there's 100 rotavirus ingested by a calf that produce a billion. So there's this massive upcycling uh, of increase in infection pressure. So the next three calves then are exposed to a dramatically higher amount. So we think about why do we see a lot of infection pressure towards the middle and end of calving time? Well, it's that multiplication effect. So anything we can do with hygiene to reduce the spread of disease and the buildup of that infection pressure, be it through equipment, all in, all out systems, regularly cleaning out, regularly freshly bedding calving pens, well, that is reducing the buildup of infection pressure. And calf scour is a good example of that. So again, daily and weekly habits that are there to set up that help us achieve those goals of reduction of infection pressure. Um, again, you know, if we look at colostrum, I'll talk about that. I think we've got good on the quality piece, we've got good on the quickly piece, we've got good on the quantity piece, but the cleanliness piece around colostrum is, is one area I would think we've got a lot of challenges still on farm. So the first 24 hours on farm is make or break from a calf health perspective. Every farm is slightly different for challenges, but be it suckler or dairy farm. But what happens close up calves at calving, particularly heifers, will impact colostrum quality. Hygiene for the newborn calf, they're born pretty immune and naive, so they have no uh, immune system. They need the antibodies from colostrum. Um, they've got some open uh, areas, particularly oral, okay, the navel as well. So how clean is the environment? If we think about a suckler cow, other hygiene is quite important. If we're letting the cow, obviously, the cow, sorry, <laughs> if, when the calf is suckling the cow. If we look at a dairy cow, then if we look at cow-calf separation, the timing of that, particularly if we have dirty udders, are we letting calves? Calves, stay with the mother is that a source of infection particularly in a seasonal system which is very uh, compact 
we're trying to minimize infection there so attention to detail is really really key in the first 24 hours with a focus on colostrum feeding you know looking at maybe vaccination protocols we can do to the cow and um, all those sort of things are really important from a calf health perspective when we look at rearing calves then, so if I'm buying dairy calves or I'm buying calves off a dairy farm, I'm a dairy to beef system, um, we need more integration here. We need dairy, uh, beef farmers and dairy farmers talking to each other. Um, if we think about genetics loading the gun, uh, management pulling the trigger, but like genetics creates the potential to utilize Doreen Cardin's word um, and you know, look at it, maybe AI and quality calves. And this is something maybe with some of the challenge around live export and numbers and the seasonality that you know, having saleable calves um, is something we need to be thinking about. Management will affect calf health. So any farm, I'm gonna be buying calves off a farm that's doing a really good job on colostrum. What are disease risks on farm of origin? Um, you know, look even at transport. So I've seen this really as a big factor. If we think about transporting calves, young calves, long distances, it does create stress. So a more integrated solution where dairy and beef farmers are talking together, I think that's the future. And we need to be having those conversations and thinking about that from a calf health perspective. Okay, finally he gets on to his being brain into the basics. These are my six areas that if you want to rear healthy calves, we've got to focus in on. Okay, colostrum. My God, another vet talking about colostrum. Boring. No, um, I'm joking. Um, colostrum is still probably the main building block. And I think we've the messaging is getting out there. Okay, colostrum. Um, building block of calf health. You know, it is the foundation. You know, quality, really important. Can be influenced by prepartum feeding. Uh, getting it in quickly, that gut is like an, a sponge at the start to, to absorb these, particularly antibodies, um, and the right quantity, you know, three to four litres for a dairy calf. The quantity for suckler cows is slightly different because the quality is, the volume is lower, the quality is up, but you know, we're aiming for that three to four litres. Um, and if calves will drink more of it, um, perfect. Every system is slightly different. I'm a fan of. Uh, getting calves to drink the colostrum. Uh, there, you know, there's research on stomach tubing uh, is you know, from an efficiency point of view, and it's just personal preference really, supports that stomach tubing colostrum is also very effective, but I would say be very careful around hygiene with that stomach tube. And I'll explain about um, hygiene next. We can measure colostrum quality on farm. I was crazy about this a couple of years ago um, and it is very useful, um, but it is very laborsome to, to test every sample. I think a refractometer is a cheap tool and uh, it can be bought on Amazon or places like that or Alibaba and they're not, they're not, not very dear. Maintenance is important, keeping them clean. We're aiming for them on the BRICS refractometer on over 22, over 25, ideally and, and it's very interesting when you look at pre of feeding how we can influence that and I've seen that on farm and um, I think it's something that can be done and I, I, I would say at a, at, a, at a minimum especially when you're calving in your heifers to sample the heifers coming in because they'll give you a good indication of quality it's always they're always a little bit lower than cows in my, from my experience and then you know do the first couple of heifers keep an eye on it and having that tool there if you have any doubt to test colostrum quality because if it's poor colostrum quality it is going to set the calf back and um, probably you know reset mid-season and towards the later end of the season when it's very important because if we're seeing poor quality you know there's things we can do with the diet to manipulate um, colostrum quality so what's new on colostrum quality well i think the one area we probably need to focus on really really uh, and think about is um okay we know about the immunity story with colostrum we know about the antibodies the calf is born immune and naive um, and we know the importance that they're getting the memory of their mother's immune system from the farm through colostrum but um what also is really exciting about colostrum is the epigenetics piece, the priming of the young gut. Um, and that becomes really interesting when we look at in hygiene and colostrum. So if we've got pathogens like E. coli getting in there first, well, they're going to disrupt the absorption uh, and passive transfer of these antibodies. But they're also going to you know, affect the young gut. So getting that good start with colostrum is key to priming the young calf for the first 24, 48 hour weeks of life, but for future lifetime performance. And you know, we're learning about colostrum all the time. And again, if we look at the constituents of colostrum versus mature milk, there is some really big differences there. And colostrum is nature's gift. It is 
priming the young gut with so many different, uh, like in insulin growth factor, you know, different things that are in colostrum from a future lifetime performance in both humans and animals. It's really interesting we look at colostrum and its an impact. So my message in colostrum really is, you know, everyone's going to hear the, the, the one, two, three or the quality, quantity and quickly piece, but hygiene is something we need to focus on. Because colostrum is so high in fat and protein, it's the ideal environment for bacterial overgrowth. So particularly when we come to the later parts of the season, we're leaving colostrum in buckets. You know, I have done the sampling and seen the pathogen growth in these, and that is going to impact. So anything we can do to improve you know, um, the cleanliness of colostrum. So if we look at buckets, we look at dump lines, if we look at, you know, milking machines for colostrum, if we look at for using stomach tubes, really, really, these are bottlenecks we need to look at from a hygiene perspective. Again, I've done a lot of research in the microbiome space. That's where Precision Microbes is in that space of helping prime the young gut. But colostrum is really key to this as well. Again, just some samples from milk and colostrum that I would have was sampled on farm, looking at the pathogens that were, you know, growing. That we, you know, the colostrum looks clean or the milk looks looks clean, but there's a lot of pathogens in it. We want to avoid that infection pressure if we can. So feeding, uh, feeding the calf is really, really key. And I said about optimizing biology and behavior. Um, so if we think about biological feeding, how much milk can a calf actually drink? Well, they definitely can drink more than uh, six liters a day, and um, they'll feed six to eight times a day. So we just need to be mindful of that. Um, there's nothing wrong with twice a day feeding, and you know if 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 we have uh, challenges on farm around actual people to do the jobs, uh, I can see why people move to once a day feeding in four to five weeks. But we do need to be mindful of stressing the biology of the calf. So when we look at feeding, the key things to look at is just simple, like the timing of feeding, the temperature of milk, particularly if it's cold. Um, if we're feeding whole milk uh, versus replacer, and a lot of farms are feeding replacer, it's just the quality of it. Uh, again, with milk, looking at hygiene. We must remember calves are monogastrics, and you're never going to get as much value from a kilo of dry matter for a kilo of muscle growth as you will in the first weeks of life. So. Um, optimizing that and in this picture here i have i think it's soy milk and ordinary milk and the reason you know i get my children to drink milk uh, cow's milk is because of the amino acid profile and the health value and i think when we look at plant-based milks they just do not deliver on that front so when we think about a calf then and we think about the value of the uh, good quality milk replacer or whole milk and the amino acids in that for muscle growth and muscle building and even future lifetime performance well, we don't want to be uh, substituting a, a replacer that's full of plant-based proteins or, you know, pushing a calf biologically too early to wean them very, very early. That can create a challenge. Now, if it's working on farm for you, fine. But if you look at the reverse of what we're trying to do, promoting milk from a human health point of view, um, well, we're sort of, we don't want to reverse it with our calves and not understand that uh, um, good quality milk or whole milk or milk replacer would, has to have animal proteins in it. Feeding more of it builds more muscle. It's the kilo of dry matter in versus the kilo of meat on the calf, which makes all the difference. Um, so quality replacers are really important, protein, ash, fiber, all those things. Um, looking at a good quality replacer, obviously it's, it's more often than not replaced the price. Really important we think about feeding and we're trying to wean calves, the introduction of fresh meal daily. So getting calves to eat some meal, not throwing meal in on top of meal and letting it heat, just getting calves nibbling a little bit that fresh meal every day. Water is a really, really important uh, of the forgotten nutrient to most animals, but it's really important as well to have fresh available water. And um, you know, because that young rumen is developing it's a fermentation bat and water is an essential part of that and then the fiber to stimulate um that um muscular wall of the rumen and the straw is very very effective here um, now with feeding i know there can be labor shortages on farm and that can be challenging so we have to adapt our efficiencies to to cope with that i think automatic uh, feeders really help in that space with calves um, but just look at feeding, reviewing all protocols, mixing constituents and quality. So just getting really refined in feeding because that detail, that attention to detail and consistency in young calves makes a huge, huge difference. Um, when we're looking at automatic feeders as well, just making sure that we're uh, uh, able to position them correctly. We can um, 
make sure what's the word um i'm i'm getting drawing a, bla a blank um we can cal calibrate the machine calibrates the word i was looking for um and the fact that i've um stuttered on it should be an important one for everyone to remember calibrating the machine learning how to calibrate and doing that regularly um and just reviewing calf performance i think certainly from a cold perspective we you know if we if it is very cold it's very cold at the moment when i'm recording this webinar uh, that we have the ability to feed more in cold times you know we can talk about cold and calves later but that's one way of adapting to cold is giving calves some more milk so they're not as metabolically challenged so consistency and attention to detail that is the key message uh, around calf feeding and we can you know the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining reviewing feeding protocols where are we mixing up the milk if you're using a replacer? What's the quality like? What's the temperature? You don't have to feed warm milk replacer to calves. It's something you can do maybe in colder weather. Um, but just making sure that hygiene and that mixing, and I've seen this in farm where you actually go in with the refractometer and you look at milk um, osmolality can, can vary depending on who's mixing it. And you know, just if you are uh, got used to feeding a certain amount of replacer and mixing it up, that um that you're just every so often check that system to make sure it's it's correct because if we've got the osmolality right we can affect um digestion um so it's just that attention to detail i'm probably laboring on that a bit now next one of the key areas is hygiene so when i think about hygiene now um there's certainly loads of lovely protocols you can look at particularly when we look at biofilms and slimes building up and cold water, hot water, uh, rinsing. Um, certainly, I'm not going into the detail of that. And there is that is, the, that is the next level up of attention to detail. But how workable is it? How simple can you make the hygiene process? So if it's buckets, if it's feeding equipment, how easy can you do it? And this is the reduction of infection pressure, please. And this is critical in any calf rearing system but particularly in seasonal systems we're trying to reduce infection pressure over time and what happens during a busy calving season is we're gung-ho in february march with more calves coming with more infection pressure and people are getting tired so anything that's workable to just probably the time to double down in hygiene is in the first week of march to really start focusing in on that and having these protocols simple so how often are we washing feeding equipment um you know, is it twice a week, three times a week, once a day? Uh, some people, will, uh, some farms have been on, will wash them after every feed. Again, from a time perspective, that might be difficult, but certainly if we look at uh, even just replacing teats, washing teats, all those simple things can make a huge difference. And um, again, if we look at the automatic feeding stations, uh, just from a hygiene perspective, how easy are they to clean? Drainage around them. So a calf will defecate and urinate when it's feeding more. So having maybe around feeders, a concrete and straw lie back allows just to keep that hygiene around the calf a little bit easier. And the key thing with good habits, um, be it cleaning and hygiene, is how easy we can make them. So if we think about our protocols on a daily and weekly basis, how easy are they to do? So if we look at even something as simple as bedding sheds with straw, uh, is the straw two sheds away? Is it somewhere handy that we can put a fork in and actually get it out into the sheds? Is it somewhere above calves maybe that we can just pull it down that makes it easy? Anything we can do, any habit we can create to make life easier. And one story in hygiene, I was in the UK uh, last year, well this year uh, at a conference and I met a lady who was um, uh, new to calf rearing. She was uh, in probably She'd spent 10 years working uh, in, as a, she had a fish shop and then she spent 20 odd years uh, cleaning a carpet cleaning business. But now for the last four years, she'd been calf rearing on a farm, on a large farm. And um, she had transformed, because I spoke to the owner of the farm as well, she had transformed calf health. And what she was so diligent on from her past, you can imagine, from carpet cleaning was just that attention to detail around cleaning. What happened is I had a little sponge, sponges on my stand that I was using to, to animate the precision microbe story. And she thought they were um, uh, free to be given away. And that's how we started our conversation. She was going off with one of my sponges. And I said, come back, come back. I need them for demonstration purposes. But actually, we got talking and she said, I love cleaning. And she explained to me what she was doing on farm. And it was that attention to detail um, and again if you look at the studies not to be sexist uh, out there but um, women make better calf rares than men because they are more detail orientated for the most part so how can uh, we on farm and again I, I would 
probably caveat that I would make a bad calf error is my, you know, my attention to detail uh, in those areas might be poor. I have to make systems here. My office behind me looks a little bit messy, but I have to actively, um, because to, to try and make life easy, tidy my desk, tidy my car, make life easy, I have to force myself to do it. So it's the same on farm. How can we make processes like cleaning easier for us like having a cleaning station where we have a high power or uh, high pressure water maybe have hot water have our disinfectant and our brushes they're handy with a drain on a concrete pad that we can just make cleaning easier for us you know it could be a, a cut in half ibc and uh, where you can actually just dunk your feeding equipment in so just think about how can i make cleaning easier and hygiene because it really does deliver hygiene around half feeding equipment makes a huge difference Okay, another basic area, but it's very hard to get right, is fresh air. And I suppose ventilation, air movement, these are all names for the same thing. And we know that calf housing is a big bottleneck, or has been a big bottleneck in Irish systems. We have gone up in numbers, uh, post quota, and um, you know some farms invested in, in, in cow accommodation and calf accommodation, but probably cow accommodation was number one, and calves were a little bit of an afterthought. We, but we are catching up with more and more farms looking at, and I've been at probably three weeks, for the last three weeks, I, I was at a number of calf health events, and um, a lot of conversations around new calf housing being built on farm with the recognition that more people are going to be rearing calves and there might be a market pre-weaning but certainly will be post-weaning so people are are looking at this so when we look at uh, calf housing in fresh air it's critical to get right and we understand what fresh air actually does well it's nature another one of nature's gifts it contains ozone it actually is active okay keeping things dry um, and if we think about what bacteria like they like moisture and wet conditions um, and damp conditions so and it keeps things dry um, but also the, the fresh air is the ability to kill pathogens now the big challenge for calves is fresh air and warm calves don't always go together we know the challenge of drafts so if we've got cold air blowing into a shed at high pressure at high speed well then it can bring down the critical temperature of calves and that can depress immunity so this is probably one of the big challenges around calf sheds uh, in our seasonal spring and you know uh, spring calving system that can be hard to get right and this is something i get all the time but sure the weather changes how do we get this right so it's a very farm by farm perspective but if we can get fresh air right, it makes a huge difference to calves. And the best way of assessing fresh air, we can use uh, smoke bombs and everything like that, but our very sophisticated tool in between our eyes, our nose, just smelling for that ammonia smell. If we're getting an ammonia smell in sheds, well, it's a sign of poor air quality. And even ammonia itself affects the cilia of the, of the, of the respiratory tract, the cells that, that actually waft if I can do this right, waft up the, the pathogens and clear the airways can affect that. So we want to improve air quality and air movement at calf level. So again, that becomes a big challenge. So we know that uh, this is getting this right is really hard because calves actually lie down for 80% plus of the day. That means they're about six inches off the ground, their noses. So how do we get air movement down there? Um, so this is a really hard bottleneck to get right. So what can we do well we can look at um more open sheds well that means you know you're more prone to drafts and fresh air and colder calves so we can look at feeding more or certainly calf jackets are, are brilliant at keeping a that calf in its own microclimate warm um, or we can look at closed off sheds with ventilation tubes again in cold times that can make calves cold through the positive pressure ventilation so we can look at adapting this but it's it's, it's shed by shed farm by farm and um, again even the position of the shed is important for this but what we need to be able to do is have plenty of fresh straw in there uh, a good warm bed for calves uh, adapt maybe feeding to feed more milk at times of cold um, I'm a fan of certainly more open shed if we look at the side walls um, uh, Yorkshire boarding is a fantastic um, inlet for air because it takes the, the velocity out of air but still gets good air movement through so again this is farm by farm I could do a full lecture on calf housing um, but it is something critical to get right and can be a challenge for um, seasonal calving systems um, but so we're trying to get air movement down at calf level at a very low level um, you know when we even walk into a farm we're probably um, I'm um, six foot we're near you know we're, we're, we're five foot above where we should be assessing air air flow or air movement at so ideal calf housing 
Simple system. Think about your daily routines. You know, shed position is massive, but space per calf, this is a big, big one. Um, now, optimal space per calf, I disagree with what the literature says, and my own theories on it, I'm not paying for the concrete, I know, but 1.5 meters squared per calf as a minimum, but these calves grow, I'd be aiming for two meters squared per calf. Now, we can get around this by maybe having um, less of a space per calf in a straw lieback, but allowing that overall two meters squared space. So when I think about that, say if the, the, feeder, is, the feeder is here, we have a portion of, of concrete, and then back here we have our, sorry, yeah, I'm okay. So if we think about the feeder being here, we have a portion, I can't get this right, uh, a portion of concrete, and then back here is the straw lieback. But we do need space per calf. Um, drainage is huge in sheds. So we, if we don't uh, reduce down moisture content, well, then we create a perfect environment for, ca for bacteria and pathogens to grow. Again, if we think about that 1 in 20 slope, it can look very, very steep, but it really helps with draining moisture out of it sometimes when short straw is short we, you know i've seen bark mulch or something else like that used and straw on top of it but it only works again if drainage is excellent underneath to remove the moisture ventilation helps with that and then we need to make it easy to clean out so can we get a loader in there mid-season um or you know a couple of times a season to clean out these calf pens if we're not cleaning out calf pens, you know, using extra straw all the time, but that bedding get quite built up. But having drainage right underneath is really important. So from a calf perspective, if we're going for more open sheds, well, then we need to be feeding more milk, more straw and jackets. And I think that at a calf level helps with comfort. And then thinking about setting up the clean equipment, making up powder, just your daily routine. You know, if you're using your milk tanker or, or your um, your milk crate or wherever, you know, just think about your positioning. If you're looking at automatic feeders, positioning around drainage, calibration, they're the key things you need to get right. So planning ahead for calf housing is really key and getting those simple things right. Probably the biggest challenge to get right, and it's very hard to give very specific um uh, advice because every farm is slightly different depending on where the position of the shed is the type of shed but air movements at calf level is really really critical so calf comfort again um, people would have heard me talk about cow signals before you know it's kind of understanding and optimizing the biology of the cow same for calf so what's good for calf is good for the far farmer I've talked about that in the behavior piece and again, remembering the calves are monogastrics for the first three to four weeks. They really value high quality replacer or whole milk because of the amino acid profile, getting that growth on calves. And then as they develop their lumen, they're not as prone to cold, but they love dry, warm lie. So nesting score is something people talk about that you can see a calf lying down and we can see their um, elbows um, in the straw, that it's right up around where they can nest in straw. Um, so cold is probably the big one in the Irish system for calves because the calf likes a critical temperature or normal temperature of about, you know, between 10 and 15 degrees. If it drops below freezing like it is today, well, that puts huge metabolic pressure on the calf. So the calf is using up energy to stay warm. And if a calf gets cold, their immune system is compromised. And also viruses and pathogens like colder temperatures are tend to multiply in those. So that's why we see more disease issues in the winter time ourselves. So again, warm, well bedded sheds, uh, oh, sorry, warm, I suppose, you know, straw being the ultimate insulator, plenty of it, enough space per calf. Um, and again, from a calf comfort point, just a bit back to, to, to um, behavior, calves, we want to eliminate negative experiences, but calves can have positive experiences as well. You know, we've seen these um, these kind of hopper balls been hung up and sort of things for calves to stimulate and play play with in pens. You know, that, that that's something we're going to hear more of as we understand calf behavior and their social creatures. So anything we can do to optimizing those behaviors in a system, we're going to have healthier calves. So very simple lesson here for me. Uh, well, not a simple lesson. My most common challenge seen is not enough straw and too many calves in one space. OK, so well then. I think three things that we need to get right is drainage. So the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. If we've got poor drainage in sheds, is it something we need to do in advance of calves coming? Particularly we see automatic feeders been put in, getting drainage right around them. More straw solves a lot of problems, okay? More straw, so depending on the availability and price of straw, that's an easier conversation to have, but it's still the ultimate insulator for calves. Uh, I've seen wood chip, I've seen peat, I've seen different things used, but nothing beats straw. More space per calf, I think that is something definitely um, we need to get right. 
air movement at calf level. And these investments invest in, require you know, in time, so your advisor, your vet coming on farm, getting help to assess the calf shed is really important. And remembering that there's nothing like the cost of disease. So we very look, much look at the cost of disease and maybe the antibiotic or the treatment, but it's the future lifetime performance or maybe the, the calf has died. But it's the lifetime performance that's lost by not focusing on this, these bits and these really important bits. So if I'm looking at calf sheds, drainage really right, loads of straw on a well-drained shed, giving calves plenty space and then trying to optimize air movement. And if we're get more air into the shed through positive pressure for ventilation or mere open sheds that we adapt through more feeding or the use of calf jackets. Again, remembering all the stressors on calves. Remember we covered stress early on and um, there's lots of them there. Stress affects immunity. So anything we can do to minimize stress um, and just a little bit, if we're dehorning, particularly dehorning, we're using local anesthetic, um, I would use anti-inflammatories, again with castration, trying to eliminate pain, because pain has a negative impact on immune function, it produces stress, produces cortisol, which inhibits uh, immune responses, and we see, you know, it's not unusual to see calves coming down with pneumonia or other issues post-stress, so the massive changes in weather, massive, you know, uh, around debudding or castration, where we haven't gone appropriate with pain relief, we, we see disease occurring at that time. So transport's another one, particularly we're buying and moving calves. You know, if we are moving calves, you know, we have the outside farm or calf rearers, absolutely load the, 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 the shed with straw, not load them with calves, uh, the trailer with straw. Make sure ventilation is okay, but calves are very warm at that level. They can lie down a deep bed of straw. Um, you know, if they're traveling long distances, stopping for a hydrated drink or something like that, that type of attention to detail can really make a difference. It might sound like it's very intensive um, and overcomplicating transport, but if we want to rear calves, healthy calves, this is the type of thinking we need to get into around reduction of stress at all stages up to weaning. Again, just on weaning, I didn't say about, you know, what's the optimal, you know, people talk that you can wean calves, at, you know, you know, we're going to look for a double of, wheat, of, of from a birth weight. We can talk about timing, but people talk about calves eating at least a kilo of meal at weaning time. I think that conversation has to move from a kilo to at least two kilos of meal. That's where that would be my target for farms that calves are eating two kilos. We know at that stage that their rumen is fully developed. They're getting um, a, a suitable meal with high protein, that's go, uh, plant protein that's going to uh, take over from that uh, amino acids. We have a totally different, we have a rumen in it now, but I think a kilo of meal at weaning is is a little bit tight i'd aim for two kilos just a bit on diseases um very conscious this is uh, i love talking about calves i have felt this hour going very it hasn't it's flew by um and probably nobody listening to me at this stage okay so calf pneumonia it's a big killer of calves yeah we know it's the second biggest uh, killer of calves after diarrhea but we don't know realize enough it's the performance loss okay we think about antibiotic usage as well it's probably the number one user of antibiotics treating calves with pneumonia it's the the, the lungs are like the metabolic engine of the calf taking in oxygen and when we have damage there that ability is reduced so you know we don't see these heifers okay they might get to the parlor the first year but we you know the, the data would show they don't survive into year two we can talk about the bugs. I think we still will get pneumonia on farm. So getting really good at knowing what the normal looks like, getting in early with treatments is really key. Um, but but anti-inflammatories and appropriate antibiotics, that's a conversation with your own vet. If you are seeing issues with calf pneumonia year on year, think about immunity. Think about fresh air uh, and ventilation and getting that right. Um, so has the calf got the immune system to cope with these challenges? Are we creating the mi right microclimate around the calves that we can maximize fresh air and reduce pathogens? And then of course, vaccine strategies that are um, suitable for the farm. And everybody would love a one fits all vaccine strategy, but they can be complicated by the cases that you're seeing on farm. Some farms uh, can rear healthy calves with uh, no vaccines. Most farms now are using some sort of uh, pneumonia vaccines and some are using very intensive programs. So what's the right one for you? Well, what are your challenges? Are you seeing issues with calf pneumonia? They're preventative, so we want to prevent them uh, and they have a role to play. They can be quite costly when you get into viral and bacterial and combinations, but if they, uh, if these are your, pneumonia is your challenge, they, the, the, the reward far outweighs the cost of these and there's a huge cost benefit. 
So when we think about pneumonia, this is the key message again. So uh, this is the pluck here, and this is you know the airways here coming into the cranial front lobes, back lobes. A lot of the pathogens when you when you do postmortems in these calves, um, they seed into the, the the cranial or the front of the lungs, causing irreversible damage. Uh, like you know, interstitial pneumonia. Just does that 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 tissue is is irreversibly damaged, meaning performance is lost. Um, we've bacterial pneumonias, we've viral pneumonias, we've unfortunately growing trend of mycoplasma pneumonias or ear drops and swell joints, and that can be difficult because there's no vaccine for mycoplasma. So it's back to focusing on all the other areas actually, and um, that really forms part of mycoplasma and of course then with grazing in older calves lungworm is an issue we've learned through covid everyone's a respiratory vaccine expert now our respiratory virus expert but it was the key things ventilation and space were the messages and calves are no different as well um, so i suppose when it comes to vaccine options there's lots of timings i prefer people talk to their own vet about that but one thing I'll say, if you're paying money for vaccines, store them correctly and administer them correctly, particularly when we look at live vaccines and we're looking at mixing liquids and powders, we're just doing that correctly. So what are the risks in your farm? When are you seeing respiratory issues? What are the types of respiratory issues you're seeing? Um, now, we're in the middle of an RSV uh, pretty bad, I would say, uh, outbreak in kids. Um, um, and our, my own kids have had I would, what I would suspect is RSV, and it's been very, very hard on them. RSV virus in calves is quite similar. It's, um, you know, it's the most common virus. It's probably in most of our farms. So when we think about immunity and infection pressure, it's there. So if immunity drops, we're going to see we're going to see challenges. So it would be one of my key things to vaccinate against uh, in uh, particularly uh, with young calves would be RSV would be one of my primary thinkers. Um, Again, with this bacterial vaccines as well, there's not a, there is a mycoplasma vaccine, um, but you know it's not a licensed one here in Ireland. But you know the main ones like manhemia and histophilus, there is vaccines there. So timing of these bacterial vaccines or combination vaccines, and especially if they're dead, giving the first one priming the immune system, the second one to really stimulate that immunity, and then you have protection at a certain period of time. So farm by farm, I think this is really important. There's some really good RSV vaccines on the market, um, and I think they should be a minimum uh, when you look at calf rearing. Calf diarrhea, again, probably the number one cause of mortality and morbidity in young calves before three or four weeks of age. Crypto rota, E. coli, nutritional scours. We think about infection pressure, we said this earlier on, it's that multiplication effect that causes all the challenges. So again, what can we do to reduce infection pressure and improve immunity? And that's where Precision Microbes is in that space of really helping from a gut health perspective, um, particularly when you look at your, um, your nutritional, bacterial, viral scours, helping support that gut and immune system. Crypto is quite a challenge. So I still would think crypto protocols should be in place on farm. So with calf scour, what infectious agents are you dealing with? Are you dealing with cryptosporidium, E. coli, rotavirus, combination? Can we do what can we do between seasons um, to completely clean out calf sheds to minimize infection pressure? You know, vaccinations and other strategies we can look at with cows that optimize immunity and colostrum quality. Colostrum, colostrum quality is colostrum, sorry, is key. Feeding, I think um, we certainly have seen you know uh, the adoption of maybe once a day feeding earlier in calves uh, from an efficiency point of view. But when you look at um, from my experience, when we have bad bad outbreaks of calf diarrhea where feeding is at the lower to optimal levels we can just have a wipe out of calves so where with higher feeding levels calves can recover quicker hygiene 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 is key and precision microbes now is a really effective tool as part of the calf health and performance piece and gut health piece that i think people should be thinking about uh, that 30 mils for 30 days if calves get diarrhea during that period, topping them up, it's a super, super tool. Um, I am incredibly biased, I know, but of all the projects and products I've worked with, I have been so excited about this product because of the results that it's delivering on farm. Again, think about um, calves with diarrhea. It's been a very effective tool to help recovery at the higher dose rates, but at the lower optimal 30 mils for 30 days, we're helping maintenance and eubiosis as well. Again, the postbiotics, the pro and postbiotic liquids is a key element to this. Okay, so the, that's the liquid pro and postbiotics. Also, we've got other uh, gut enhancing herbs in there as part of the culturing technique that are really um, differentiate this product. It's a game changer in gut health. So putting into practice, 
practice, practice uh, raising healthy calves. The key message for me is attention to detail, consistency, and understanding biological optimization. I think they all make a difference here when we look at calf rearing. Again, there's huge value as well in knowing the normal. So spending time walking through calves, and it even includes if you've got automatic feeding stations, I mean, they will alert us to calves not feeding and give a really good early indication, but there's nothing quite like, like walking through calves, listening for coughing, looking at noses, watching ears, looking at calf tribe and vigor. One of the things with precision microbes across all the trials and now on farms is people will see a difference in the calf coat uh, and um, they will say to me, there's a shine off the calves. And again, that's a good indication that these calves are healthy and thriving but then when we see dirty bums swelling joints swelling navels swelling anything and um, that we act early and what's this an indication of we're always going to get sick calves but the key to treatment success a lot of times is obviously the right treatment which you'll talk to your vet about but early intervention is key and we only get good at early intervention when we know the normal and spot things the abnormal then in calves so think about on your farm what you can do to improve immunity. I've talked about all the immunity pieces like um, colostrum, um, feeding, you know, the right environment, avoiding cold, all those simple things. Also, infection pressure, reducing that down, space per calf, drainage, fresh air, key, key things that we can do to reduce infection pressure. If you're starting calf rearing, um, give yourself every chance. So certainly we are going to look at more and more people rearing their own calves but when you look at people maybe who are getting into calf rearing the same rules apply you know obviously this is an important conversation for dairy farmers as well uh, in, in in picking the suitable genetics that's going to have a more saleable calf we know sex semen allows us now to breed more of our optimal uh, female replacements but then look at the genetics for your beef calves coming through a more saleable calf again when you're starting out rearing looking at minimal sourcing so knowing the history of the farm the disease processes the management processes there and getting them to your farm from a minimum dis or minimize that distance minimize mixing of calves if at all possible i know it's easier to source a consistent batch through the market or somewhere like that but the challenge is where you've huge numbers of calves coming from different sources uh, crypto could be a problem here mycoplasma could be a problem there um and you know some bacterial pneumonia here and we have that you know when we have mixing of animals and stress and transport we've more shedding and that creates a challenge so if you are thinking about rearing calves start slowly dip the toe in the water and focus more here on a farm of origin that you know about and i think the future will be that integration where we actually know more about the genetics that are going into the cows and i think that will be the future of those more integrated systems we've a lot we've, we've worked to do there but look um with challenges i think everyone talks about challenges not enough people stand in the solutions queue okay main messages consistency and attention to detail do the simple things well and this was a powerpoint slide i had at a recent thing and i said look in fairness if you apply these top two lines to anything in life you will achieve results colostrum is the building block for you know calf health and um, hygiene is probably the area we need to improve on and farm with colostrum get the environment right for calves straw fresh air space and drainage when we are using medicines like vaccines or anything like even precision microbes or any other supplements use them correctly look at your performance get advice from your vets nutritionists and advisors get help on your farm be have the self-awareness to think about okay this is where i'm at this is where i need to go what are the good habits to, to calf rearing hopefully i've stimulated some thought around the six principles or the basics that maybe you can assess in your own head and how we can maybe even if it's that one decision to put 50 percent more straw in the pins in the first two to three weeks that may be um just enough to improve calf rearing that extra bit this year Again, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you've stayed on for this CAF webinar, um, uh, it's been released over de December or early Christmas, so maybe it's it's long, but people have had time to, a little bit more time uh, as we prepare for calving. Um, watch out for this campaign, 30 mils for 30 days. It's our January campaign for Precision Microbes and Interchem who distribute our product through vets in Ireland. Um, and again, we want that message out there. People have seen the 
precision microbes working now. The feedback from farms and vets is excellent. Since we launched in February with 30 testimonials for a season and a half of farmers and vets talking about their experience. We'll have one a day on social media. Um, and again, I think they're game changers in gut health. Watch out for the 30 for 30 campaign. Happy Safe Farming. Have a nice Christmas. If you have listening to this after Christmas, have a good uh, or happy new year to you and a safe uh, and good uh, calf rearing uh, season ahead. Um, that's it. Take care, everybody. Happy safe farming and thanks for listening.